Hello, I'm Brian Kramer. Now, most of you probably know me as the world famous author of humorous science fiction novels like the Zero Calvin series, What the Luck, and Flickr World. Many of you also probably know me as the guy who does the humorous yet informative 3D printing videos on YouTube. But what you probably don't know about me is that I'm a full time assembly worker for Dell Air USA, a company in Manasquan, New Jersey that does uh, custom made to order cable assemblies for both commercial and military applications. Now, Dell Air builds just about every kind of cable assembly imaginable, for everything from digital and power cables to uh, coax cables used in RF applications, as well as fiber optic cables. Now, I've been with Dell Air since 1998, and I've personally built just about every kind of cable assembly imaginable, everything from uh, cables that go into quantum supercomputers to nuclear submarines. Now, one of my specialty skills here at Dell Air USA is in assembling fiber optic cables, and it is that expertise that I want to share with you today. Now, when I say fiber optics, you know, you might think of fiber optic Christmas trees or maybe that Toslink cable you have floating around in your junk drawer somewhere. Now, those are examples of fiber optics, but they're of the low-grade plastic variety. But what we want to discuss here today is the high-end glass fiber optic cables that carry the world's communications. Guaranteed that if you're watching this on the internet right now, then somewhere along the way, this video is being carried to you through fiber optic cables just like this one. Only longer. Let's start with the bulk fiber optic cable itself. Now, Dell Air USA doesn't manufacture fiber optic cable. It leaves that to the professionals, and then it buys it from them in these big spools you see here. As you can see from the samples here, fiber optic cable comes in a wide variety of styles, just like copper does. We have a, a single strand variety, which has a single fiber optic line running through it, as well as multi-fiber varieties, which have multiple fibers packaged in a single jacket. This one here is called a breakout cable because the individual fibers can be broken out into individual fully jacketed fiber cables at the ends. This style of multi-fiber cable is very robust, but it also is quite bulky. So for longer runs, uh, some sort of distribution cable is used. Uh, these cables have less jacketing and protection around the individual fibers uh, which reduces costs and weight, but uh, also means that um, more care has to be taken when handling the individual fibers during installation. But no matter the style of fiber optic cable, all of these contain one or more strands of glass fiber exactly like this one. Now this is called bare fiber, but it's not actually bare glass. Bare glass would be a little too vulnerable to the environment, and the slightest <clears throat> nick on the glass would give it a weak point, and any bending of that weak point would break it instantly like a twig. For that reason, the glass is actually coated with a clear plastic coating. Now the glass itself is 125 microns in diameter, which is right around the size of a human hair. With the clear coating on top, it brings the outside diameter of this bare fiber to 250 microns, which is why bare fiber is often called bare 250. And believe it or not, it is possible to mechanically strip the clear coating off of the glass fiber. So I'm using a specially pair of strippers here, which actually have a very, very tiny aperture when fully closed, just big enough to scrape off that clear coating. Okay, 
So hopefully if I zoom into this, you'll be able to see the difference. But right there is the clear coating and right there is the bare glass fiber. And what people are probably most surprised about with glass fiber is just how robust it is. I know you're expecting this to break into a thousand little pieces here as I bend it. That's really not the case. In fact, it's so flexible, I can take it and wrap it around my finger just like this without it breaking. Wow! However, at some point, when the diameter gets small enough, it will break. Incidentally, you can purchase bare fiber on spools like this one. This spool actually contains over a kilometer of bare fiber in one continuous strand. The other interesting thing about glass fiber is that it is not just a single piece of glass, but actually contains one type of glass surrounded by another. The inside glass is called the core, and the outside is called the cladding. This is the key to how fiber optics function, because the two types of glass have a different index of refraction to each other. The index of refraction is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light through a medium. You might not know this, but light actually slows down as it travels through things like air, glass, and water. And that speed reduction is reflected in the index of refraction. The slower the light, the higher the refraction index. Because of this phenomenon, Weird things happen when light encounters an interface between two materials with a different refraction index. Depending on the angle that the light approaches the interface and the difference between the refraction index of the two materials, some of the light will either bounce off of the interface and remain in the first material or pass through the interface but be refracted in a different direction. This phenomenon is responsible for both the reflections on the surface of a pool and the illusion that a pole entering the pool looks bent. Now let's apply what we just learned to fiber optics. We are going to keep things simple here, so if you're a mathematician or a physicist, I suggest that you close your eyes and hum to yourself for the next few minutes. Good. Now let's say that we have a happy little photon. If that happy little photon enters the core at a reasonably shallow angle, he will continually bounce off of the cladding all the way to the other end of the fiber. Now, let's look at his brother. His brother is a bit of a rebel. He's going to enter the core at a crazy steep angle, and because of this, he will actually escape through the cladding. Because the light is more likely to escape the core as it approaches the cladding head-on, fiber optics do not work well when bent in a small radius. To demonstrate this, I have a fiber cable here that has very few layers of protection surrounding the glass. Don't worry, we'll cover the parts of a fiber cable soon. For now, just know that this one only has the 250 micron clear coat and an orange 900 micron buffer covering the glass. I have a visible LED laser hooked up to one side of the cable, and as you can see, it is coming out the other side as expected. But if we now introduce a sharp bend in the cable, you can see that most of the light is now escaping out of the cable. Because of the sharp bend, the light is suddenly striking the cladding nearly head-on, resulting in it crashing right through. While we are on the subject of the limitations of fiber optics, let's talk about dispersion. Let's start with our two photon brothers again. Because they are of the same wavelength of light, they will travel through the core at the same speed. However, while our first brother is going to follow his usual course, his rebel brother 
has seen the error of his ways and has decided to travel the straight and narrow. Even though they start at the same time and travel at the same speed, the rebel brother is going to get to the other side of the cable first because he is traveling a shorter path. Since data is often transmitted through fiber as pulses of light, this results in the quick, sharp pulses of light being spread out into longer, softer smears of light by the time they exit the cable. If the pulses are sent too fast, you could even have a case where the end of one pulse is overtaken by the beginning of a later pulse, resulting in a loss of the information. One way to combat this is to use a laser source to send a signal, since the light from a laser spreads out much less. However, no laser is perfect and the light will still fall prey to dispersion over a long enough distance. Another way to combat dispersion is to use single mode cable. You can think of a mode as a possible pathway for light to travel. With the multi-mode cable pictured here, the core is either 50 microns or 62 and a half microns in diameter, depending on the style. While this is tiny, it is still cavernous when compared to the size of the light rays traveling through it. This gives our little photons all kinds of options or modes when traveling through the fiber. But what if we shrank the core down to a mere nine microns? Then our little photons would have to pretty much line up in single file to squeeze through the core. This results in much less dispersion, but it does have some downsides. For one, less light is being transmitted since our little photons have to line up pretty much single file. Also, as you will see later, it requires the connectors at the end of the fiber to be incredibly precise and clean. Otherwise, the core of one fiber will not line up with the core of another, or the entire core can be blocked by a tiny speck of dust. But before we look at the parts of a fiber cable and how the connectors work, let me just briefly cover another type of dispersion that affects both single and multimode cable. The type we have just discussed was called modal dispersion because it involves the modes of light. This new type is called chromatic dispersion because it involves the color or wavelength of light. A longer wavelength, like red, will travel faster through glass than a shorter one like violet, and will also be bent less by changes in the refraction index. This is how prisms work. For example, our two photon brothers have both decided to go straight through the core this time, but our rebel brother has been smoking some marijuana and has now turned a violet color and has mellowed out quite a bit. Even though they both start at the same time and travel the same distance, our rebel brother will take longer to get to the other end because he's traveling slower. Hey man, what's the rush, bro? And that, my friends, is the super simplified version of how fiber optics work. Now let's take a look at how fiber cables are constructed. I won't be covering how the actual glass is manufactured, but that is also very fascinating, so I'll leave a link in the description for a video that explains it. This is a typical single fiber cable in that it has a single fiber optic strand running through the center of it. The 125 micron diameter glass will have a 250 micron buffer around it, just like bare fiber. Around that, there is a 900 micron plastic buffer that adds an additional layer of protection. Surrounding that is a layer of aramid fiber, what most people know as Kevlar. The Kevlar not only adds more protection against outside forces, but it also serves as the strength member of the cable. When handling cable, it is natural for it to be pulled and tugged. The glass by itself would naturally be very vulnerable to this, so the Kevlar is there to provide all the pulling strength you could ask for, uh, with very little stretching, even under heavy loads. Finally, we have an outside jacket that brings our total diameter to two millimeters although this can also be seen as 1.6 or 3 millimeter varieties with more or less Kevlar stuffed in there to make up the difference. So this is all very interesting and everything, but 
You're probably wondering how we would connect two cables together. I mean, there's always splicing, of course, but that is a permanent solution, and it's only used to repair breaks or where low-loss connections are absolutely critical. So this is where fiber optic connectors come into play. But just like fiber optic cable, fiber optic connectors come in a variety of styles but these are probably the most common ones seen today in commercial use. Now while all of these probably look different to each other, they all have the basic same components. Um, they all have you know, the cable going into some kind of strain relief boot. They have a connector body we have a dust cap on the end and a ceramic ferrule. So all of them are the same. Body, ceramic ferrule sticking out. Ceramic ferrule sticking out. Ceramic ferrule sticking out. Little tiny ceramic ferrule sticking out. So how these work, and you'll see the process in greater detail in just a minute, is that the glass fiber goes through the center of the connector and through the center of this ceramic ferrule. So there's a tiny, tiny little hole drilled, reamed, somehow manufactured through the center of this ferrule for the fiber glass, just big enough for the glass fiber to squeeze through. It's actually glued in place with it protruding out the end of the ferrule. Once the glue is dried, it's cleaved off and then sent through a series of polishing routines, which brings the surface of the glass and the surface of that ceramic ferrule in line with each other. So what happens is that allows the two connectors to line up and touch each other with the glass lining up. Now, you probably noticed all these seem to be male, so there's a little something strange going on, like, you know, how are they, how are they supposed to mate up? And indeed, um, you know, all commercial uh, fiber optic cable connectors are male, which is kind of weird. But uh, how they work is you always have a mating sleeve in between them. So, in the case of these, you have a mating sleeve, so it looks something like, uh, like this. It has actually a ceramic sleeve built into the center of it. So you'll connect one connector up to one side, and one up to the other side, and these actually have a bit of a spring built into them. So you see there's some give to it so that they, um, they have a consistent pressure when they mate. Now normally, these are junk connect, these are junk cables I don't really care about, but normally, always, always, you would inspect the end faces of these under a microscope before connecting, because guaranteed there's a bit of dirt in there, and guaranteed that bit of dirt is right on your glass and it's going to get crushed between the two connectors and either crack the glass or just land right uh, or block the light you know because it doesn't take much to block all or most of the light since the fiber is so tiny especially if you have say single mode like we explained with that nine micron core that's not a very big piece of dirt in order to block the light from going through. That's how they work. So the interesting thing is a lot of these commercial connectors are actually uh, the same 2.5 millimeter ferrule size so they can interconnect with each with each other. Um, you know using a hybrid adapter for instance this one here can connect here, and then the 
this guy here, I can just plug in like that, and now they're mated. And there's a variety of hybrid adapters that are made. The exception is this guy here. He's like a small form factor version of this guy. Um, this is an SC and is used uh, a lot in data centers because I, I guess maybe because it has that same uh, plug-in, pull-out, and square th aesthetic that a you know RJ45 Ethernet cable connector would have. Um, so for some reason, networking people still have it in their head that it needs to be like that. Um, but what happens is uh, sometimes the you'll have you know hundreds of these in one place and it's the connectors kind of bulky and it's hard to get a good bit of density so they've gone down to from the SC connectors to these LC connectors where you know two of these can fit pretty much in the same space as one of these the downside of that is the ferrule size is 1.25 and there, they therefore cannot mate together with the other common connector styles. In addition to the commercial style connectors, there are also a variety of military connectors. Most of these are called termini and they're designed for connectors with multiples of these in one connector. So what I mean by that is you would attach this connector onto individual cables and then a bunch of these actually go into a single connector housing like this. So if you see this one actually has uh, a place for eight of these termini to fit in. So they would simply go in the back here and they click in place. And then there's a whole uh, strain relief system behind them to manage the fiber. So that looks like something like this. So as you see here, this was an uh, eight channel connector. This guy was an eight channel connector. This one is actually just a four channel connector, but you see I unscrew the dust cap and you could probably make out the four individual termini there. The interesting thing about these military multi-channel cables is that um, some of the termini actually are female. So if you look in there, there's actual sockets instead of pins. But it's sort of just a trick because those termini actually start out male, like this one, and then there's a mating sleeve like this, which is just a... Um, stainless steel tube and it has a ceramic insert in it and that actually gets slid onto the male connector to kind of give it a you know gender change operation so you've probably noticed by now that these fiber cables are very colorful and the colors aren't chosen for aesthetic purposes but they actually mean something for instance yellow signifies that it's a single mode cable so it means it's going to have a 9 micron core. If you see an aqua or an orange color cable, you know it's going to be multi-mode, although sometimes you might not know the core size. Aqua is almost always a 50 micron core size, but the orange can be either 50 or 62.5. And, um, you know, for clarification, it's almost always printed on the jacket itself. So you see 5125, so it tells you it's a 50 micron core, 125 cladding. So with that said, you're probably wondering, like, what are all these different colors then? You've got, like, you know, you've got six different colors going on. What's that about? Um, so the fact is, even though, say, this one's orange, um, it doesn't mean that it's multi-mode. Because in breakout cables and distribution cables, like this one, the colors refer to what you would call a channel number or a fiber number. And there's actually a set order 
for which these go. So usually if they're going into a connector, they will follow a set color code. Now, in order to let the person uh, who's using them know that, say, these are single mode, a giveaway is usually they make this 900 micron buffer yellow. So if these were multi-mode, they would probably make them orange. With that said, even the uh, connector bodies and boot colors mean something. Uh, if you see like a beige or a black connector body, it usually means that it's going to a multi-mode uh, cable. Now the interesting thing is there's really not any difference between a multi-mode connector and a single mode connector, except that multi-mode connectors are usually uh, have sloppier tolerances. This is because um, you know the core is so much bigger that a little bit of misalignment doesn't matter so much. So if you look here under the microscope, you'll see like this you know, crappy Chinese one here doesn't, um, you know, the fibers sitting off to the side and you can see that there's sort of this epoxy ring on one side, so it looks almost like a crescent moon or something. Um, but that offset is so big that if this were a single mode fiber, the core at only nine microns would be so misaligned that probably most or all of the light would be attenuated because the cores between this connector and another one can be completely misaligned. So single mode connectors are always of a higher quality with tighter tolerances for that ferrule hole and all other, other tolerances held tighter to make sure that the cores align perfectly. With that said, if you see blue, it uh, usually signifies a single mode connector. Um, you know, so there's a high probability that it's going to be attached to, you know, something that's yellow. Um, really, what it signifies is a what they call a UPC connector, which is ultra polished connector. Uh, it simply means that the polish on the end face of this connector uh, is taken to a higher level to ensure the minimum of loss when it's connected to a similar connector. Um, so that is why you always see them attached to single mode cables because single mode cables are kind of by definition higher end cables. So now you're probably wondering, so what is green? Green signifies that the end face of the connector actually sits at an eight degree angle. So I'll throw up a little graphic here so you can see it better. But yeah, instead of sitting flat like this, it's actually tilted off at eight degrees. And that's uh, purpose purposefully done in order to uh, cut down on back reflection. So as the signal's traveling down the cable, as the white light's traveling down the cable, when it meets the interface between the two pieces of glass, there's always going to be some portion of it that's going to get reflected back to the source. And the lasers that go through you know, these single mode cables and some high end multi mode cables really do not like having their laser power bounced back to them. So what they do to get around this is they can't that uh, interface angle off at 8 degrees so that the reflections bounce off at 8 degrees and actually travel out through the cladding of the cable and you know dissipate out through the cladding instead of being uh, bounced directly back to the source. And that, dear viewer, is the end of part one. Please grab yourself a refreshing beverage, take a quick bathroom break, 
and join me for part two, where I will be showing you the entire process of attaching connectors onto fiber optic cable. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, consider supporting this channel on Patreon. If that isn't your cup of tea, then purchasing one of my books would also be fantastic. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video. This video brought to you by BrianKramerBooks.com. BrianKramerBooks.com for all your humorous science fiction needs.